This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me this week, one week ahead of the NFL draft, my guy Adam, the Jock Strozinski. We got so much to get into, Lions, Tigers, so much good content to bring to you this week. I'm super excited. Man, it's a good time. It's a good time to be a Lions fan they got all of the prospects that you would want coming in to visit Allen Park. We got to talk about maybe the biggest risk and the biggest decision facing Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell. Always, always enjoy bringing my guy to the main stage, my guy Adam. Cuz, what's going on? How are you sitting one week ahead of the Lions draft? I think this is one of the, the first drafts that I am super, super excited for. And I know we talk about being excited for the draft every single year, but this one... I don't necessarily have an inkling as to where Brad Holmes and the front office of the Detroit Lions are going to go. I feel like Brad Holmes has done such a good job this year during free agency and just constructing this team that this team can go any sort of ways. They can move up. They can stay at six. They can stay at 18. They can move back. They can trade out of both of those spots. They could do a ton of things. And if they stay at those positions or if they move back, there's no telling who they can draft. You know, I mean, we, we all have a guy or two guys that we really want them to take, whether it's you at 18 drafting B. John Robinson, whether it's me at six taking Jalen Carter. There is so much that they can do with both of those draft picks in the first round, and there is so many different directions that they can go. This is an exciting time of year. If you're a Detroit Lions fan, you've got to be pumped up for all of this. I'm excited. I'm pumped. I want to get into it with you. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's good. I'm excited, too. And it's perfect timing when we're recording. Just a couple hours ago, I penned a piece for All Lions. And here's where I sit. Typically, now, Adam and I have been podcasting since 2013. And also, way before we started, we would complain about the Lions well before going back to drafting Joey Harrington, going back to the days in which... The team was up and down. One year they'd be in the playoffs. The next year they'd be crazy. The whole Wayne Fonts era, the entire disaster that was the Matt Millen era. And then you had the Bob Quinn era where they basically tried to adopt an identity that was never near or nowhere close to what the Lions were about. And so my feeling is, and it's it's true, whatever Brad decides to do with that front office, they've earned the confidence level where I think I'd be okay with it. Even if they drafted Jalen Carter, even if they drafted Devin Witherspoon, even if they traded up for Will Anderson or traded up for a quarterback, the Lions front office and Brad Holmes has done such a good job that really I'm sitting pretty going, you know what? I'm just excited to find out who it is. They've done such a good job of bringing in talent, especially in the 2022 draft, five guys that have been productive already. His first draft has cornerstone players that really the first time you can say a general manager has come in and set forth a plan, whether we agree with it or not, and executed it, has been aggressive at times, has made some moves for players that potentially could be risky but have high upside, has made smart moves. So I look at it and I sit back and go, there is no real pick that would make me go, damn, I'm going to go Adam apeshit. No, Adam has come on this airwaves and said, if we pick this guy, I'm going to go crazy. Now, I don't think they're going to pick a tight end at number six, so that's fine. It could go offensive lineman that would fill a position of need. The, the player that has drawn the most interest, and thankfully, because we all know drama creates interest, has been Jalen Carter. And I am fascinated. I'm hoping. The one thing that I do hope, obviously being a podcaster and rooting for interest and drama and debatable topics, I want Jalen Carter there at number six. Likelihood he's not. I think he's going to hit Seattle, and they're a perfect fit for what he could do. He could be insulated with leadership 
and Pete Carroll has known many players. Jalen Carter will just be another one that joins the list of players that he's had to deal with. But if he's there at number six, if there's a run on quarterbacks, or if somehow some team trades ahead of the Lions that wants a quarterback, I want Jalen Carter there because whatever they decide to do will tell you exactly how the evaluation went. If they take him, that means they talked to him on his visit and they said, hey, we like it. We like what he said. We believe the bullshit of his agent and we're going to bring him in to insulate him and make him a productive player. If they pass on him, it'll tell me that, okay, the question marks that are there have been you know, really pointed out the red flags were too much. And guys, pay attention. There's some great outlets out there that have taken the model of, hey, let's just bring on as many contributors that are in the know as possible. And listen, I'm not in the business of promoting other sites as well, but the 33rd team has so much good content. They did it the right way. They said, okay, we are just a site. We're the platform. We're going to go out there and bring in every former NFL GM, every former athlete, and let's go out there and give them a platform. And one guy has come out that has a name that we all should pay attention to. Rick Spielman said, look, I watched his film. He takes plays off. What's the correlation there? His brother is Chris Spielman, who works with the Lions. So that means there has been some communication that, hey, figure out what's this guy's deal. He's not full motor all the time. So currently, as it sits, I think the Lions would pass. Just because there's more, there's safer players out there that they could bring in, like a Tyree Wilson, uh, like a Devin Witherspoon, Christian Gonzalez, I think are the three. I would power rank it number three, Jalen Carter, number two, Christian Gonzalez, number one being Devin Witherspoon, and number four, uh, probably the guy that is there but still raw is Tyree Wilson. So I think Devin Witherspoon is going to be the name that's called. Let's see in seven days if it changes. But, cuz, what's your reaction? Jalen Carter now, you've seen more information. You've seen that he's come into town. He went on Real Sports and said, yeah, teams have asked me about it, but they're not digging as much to me about it. They're just asking me, take, tell me what happened. And I think that he will still be a top 10 pick, and I think he's going to go number five. Yeah, I think he'll be a top 10 pick as well. And I do I do agree with you. I think Seattle would probably be the best spot for him, right? If he's not going to, if he's not going to fall to Detroit at six, Seattle's probably the best spot for him because – Pete Carroll and that team has an ability to to take players that have a bit of a troubled past and and do good things with them and, and squeeze the most out of them, at least for the rookie contract, and then they'll move on. Uh, you could look as far as, as Frank Clark. Frank Clark, the, the former Michigan Wolverine, had a lot of trouble, had a lot of problems. Seattle took him, and they squeezed a ton out of him. And he's still a productive player in the NFL today. Not saying he's a good guy, but he's still a productive player. Uh, Look, I think at this point, more to what you said, Brad Holmes in this front office has has basically earned the trust of the fan base, right? Brad Holmes in in this front office has basically earned the nod of the cap, whereas you're not going to freak out if they don't pick a specific guy that you have targeted. And generally, I come on and, and we talk and I'm like, look, I'm going to absolutely lose my mind if they don't take this guy or if they take that guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just blow my lid and we're going to have something to talk about the following week. Going into this draft, I'm pretty open. I'm pretty open. And, and look, early on in this process, you were, you were touting B. John Robinson at, at 18. And I was like, hell no. You do not draft a running back in the first round. And the more and more we've kind of moved along in this process, I've totally softened on it so much to the point that when I'm going through and doing my mock drafts, he's now a guy that I'm targeting to, to be a hundred percent honest with you. I did a mock draft the other day and I traded out of the sixth pick, uh, was able to move back a few spots and I ended up taking B. John Robinson at pick, I think it was 14 or, or 16. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where I have, I have kind of, Pump the brakes. I, I there's not one guy that that I'm necessarily beholden to. I think Jalen Carter for a, a a positional fit, right? You look at what the Detroit Lions are are weak in. They didn't really do a whole lot to address that defensive line, specifically defensive tackle. I know they've got a couple of guys that they've drafted in the past, and you're hoping that 
uh, uh, Ali McNeil comes back and, and, and adds to a pretty decent season that he had last year. I have no idea what's going on with Onzerike. I don't know if he's if he's going to be a bust, if he's if he's done, or if he's going to come back and contribute. Really, no clue. But you can always add to that defensive tackle position. That's why I think Jalen Carter looks to be so special. He's a pretty dominant force. I think it's going to be interesting to kind of see what happens on draft day if he falls to the Lions. Because if he does fall to the Lions and they and they take him, then that they're telling you that he's worth the risk. Anything and everything that 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 could be said or has been said about him, they're saying it's okay. We've done our due diligence and we believe that we can take care of this, we can handle this, and he's going to be a productive player. If he falls to them and they pass, it tells you that 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 interview probably didn't go good, that they're not buying whatever he's selling, and that he's not worth the risk. And it'll be interesting to kind of see where he ends up and kind of how his career ends up panning out. Because there are a lot of red flags. There are a lot of concerns with specifically Jalen Carter. Now, you brought up Devin Witherspoon. I think he's a pretty good cornerback. I don't know if I want to take him at six. I don't necessarily like drafting a cornerback at six. Now, that being said, again, I told you I'm going to give Brad Holmes the, the, the benefit of the doubt, doubt here. But if you end up at six and you can't add uh, a Tyree Wilson, you can't add a Will Anderson, uh, you decide that Jalen Carter is not worth the risk, uh, either one of the top two quarterbacks aren't there. You're in a bit of a uh, of a spot here, right? So th- the next best player is is probably a cornerback by everybody's assessment. I would try to move out. I would try to move back from that spot. But look, Brad Holmes is is going to handle it. Uh, he's going to take care of it. I, I think the betting odds right now are Devin Witherspoon to the Detroit Lions, and I could totally see that happening. I think it's going to be interesting to see who that selection is, and and I'll be honest with you. Devin Witherspoon's not a guy that I necessarily want at six, but if Brad Holmes drafts him, I'm just going to like nod my head and be like, all right, cool. We'll see what happens. We'll sit back. We'll watch this. We'll see how this plays out. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I, I believe he's done his homework. And, and the thing that I find super interesting about Brad Holmes, and, and I want to get your reaction on this, Brad Holmes basically says he doesn't have a depth chart while he's in the war room for the draft, meaning when he looks at, at at players and he's trying to evaluate who they're going to take, he's not looking at guys that he has on his roster. He is basically looking at, is this guy the best talent available? Is this guy the, the, the best fit for this team? Does this guy check all the boxes that we have? And I'll tell you this much. I, I think it pays dividends. The way he goes about drafting, and the way he goes about building a team, it is talent first. It is need Somewhere second, third, but it is it is it is talent, 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 and more talent. If you are a talented guy and you are at the top of his, he refers to it as like draft pods. I believe uh, he basically has like a group of players, like pod one. You guys are all, if you're there, uh, we're we're taking you. You have pod two. Uh, if for some reason you happen to be there later on, we're taking you. Pod three, uh, probably second, third round. So he basically goes through his pods, and whoever the top guy is in his pod. If he's available, he's taking him. I find it to be an interesting, an interesting way of going about drafting. And I think it's paid a lot of dividends for this team and for Brad Holmes. And I kind of love it because this team was so void of talent for, for so long that you basically had to go in there and you had to take best player available. And what Brad Holmes is telling you is I don't care if – if it's basically if it's quarterback, right? Like it seems that he he has a a thing with Jared Goff. But what he's telling you is, yeah, Jared Goff's the guy. But if you know Bryce Young's there, C.J. Stroud's there, and they're in our pod one, we're taking one of those guys. Uh, if Anthony Richardson is is there and he we we have a high grade on him and he's in our pod one, we're taking him. Uh, it doesn't matter who is on this roster because the best talent is going to pay dividends and we need studs. We need guys. We don't necessarily need position players. We need dogs. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to draft dogs. I love that. I love the way that, that he is constructing this team. I love the way that he has entered into the draft every single year and it has paid dividends. He has come out with dogs. He has come out with studs. You just highlighted last year's draft. 
He's got a ton of studs on this team. Uh, look, I love I love the draft philosophy from Brad Holmes. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it's 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 proven to be something where the combination of him and Roy Agnew working together, GM assistant GM putting together a a board that will effectively lead the draft. It's great, and and you don't need one. Uh, effectively having it there, potentially you could miss out on a talent that you bring in and that you believe fits your culture and, and fits what you're looking for. So yeah, I understand how the traditional draft board should shake out, but what the lions have done is they have a system in place that targets the culture fits that they believe will come in and handle business at different spots. And what they've done now is they've opened it up to be able to take best player available at multiple different spots. The only spot you really, really got to look at is backup quarterback and obviously defensive back in the interior of the defensive line. But if you did not target any of those players, then the line still would be pretty decent based on the moves that they made in free agency. So the blessing is of what you've seen is, and long story short, they have positioned themselves to be flexible. They made the moves that they wanted to make at cornerback in free agency to get experience, and now they're going to take young players at areas of need on the defensive line and offensive line. I wouldn't be surprised if they trade down to 11 with the Titans, get Skaronsky, maybe piggyback with number 18 and take Kalaja Kansi. Or they stay at number 6 and maybe even consider trading out at number 18. They could trade up number 6 or trade down number 6. So the the blessing is stay tuned, buckle up. Draft day is going to be crazy because the all all options are available for the Lions. I would not be surprised if they went up to number three and got Will Anderson. I think that should be plan A. Be aggressive. You know, I saw what you listed here, and bro, you're trying to kill me. You're trying to wear my fingers out by adding four other picks? I was like, Adam, what the hell? Uh, If they added, and I've seen here, guys, what Adam wrote, I did a mock draft, and I traded out of 18 for Chicago's 53, 61, 64, and 136. Literally, you're creating a recipe for me to overlap names and say, Lions took this guy at this spot. There is literally no way I could cover that in a logistic way without going crazy. Every draft pick is going to get three stories. And if they did that, 53... And 55 and 61 and 64 and 136, I'm done. I'm done for the next week, bro. You're going to be like, I can't type. I can't push the buttons. I can't push the mixer on with all that typing I did. Hell no, that's a lot. But I I understand, all kidding aside, what you did there. And I respect it. Because they already got 10 draft picks now. Yep. It's time to be aggressive and move up. Brad, now it gets to the point where I give you my honest, humble opinion From the Detroit Sports Podcast and All Lions, there is a guy. There is a stud. His name is Will Anderson. Mm -hmm. That's the dog. That's the dog. And I see it online, guys. I see the the faded x-ray with the dog in it. All right? One day I'm going to figure out a way to put my face in there so that you all know that I'm a dog, too. But Will Anderson is the Lions dog. That's the guy. Find a way package a second rounder, package your extra fifth rounder that you somehow just got for Jeff Okuda, move up, and even if you're willing and you have to give up a first rounder next year, if you give up two or three picks to move up to number three and you take Will Anderson and now you got Will Anderson from Alabama, you got Aiden Hutchinson, you got Charles Harris and James Houston, John Kaminsky, Isaiah Bugs. That's going to be formidable, bro. That's going to be something where... That is a pretty mean defensive and, front. And you take out uh, Josh Paschal and uh, Levi Onzerike. You only need one of those two to hit. Now you're talking about for the next four years, opposing quarterbacks are going to have to pee themselves when they come into Detroit because they're about to get rocked. And they're about to get... There's going to be no avenue to run the football. And their quarterback is going to be limping off the field each and every time they play Detroit. It's time to be aggressive. Now, I say that, but could they also turn around and trade up for Anthony Richardson? Because I don't want to alarm anybody, but had an opportunity to go down to Allen Park earlier this week, and the media asked a lot of good questions. They asked Aleem McNeil, Taylor Decker, and Amonra St. Brown, so tell us about your draft history. And they were like, I didn't even know I was going to be drafted by the Lions. 
they uh, just, I had, Amon was like, I had, I think, one Zoom meeting, and that was that. Aleem was like, I had kind of a little bit of contact. Hmm, what does that mean? That means that, the, of, of course, a lot of guys as well were part of the pre-draft visits, but a lot of guys as well could be targeted that they already know about. They watch the film, they do the due diligence, and they say, we like that guy. Guys, remember, five or more visits were made by the Lions and Brad Holmes, multiple visits to see Anthony Richardson. And he just penned a piece on the Players' Tribune, go read it, where he's like, I'm dedicated. I want to do this for my family. I have roots. Trust me. Draft me. That guy has that dog mentality. Would the Lions be aggressive and do it for a quarterback? Yet to be determined. But don't be shocked if they do. They don't. You don't need to be hearing about all these guys visiting the Lions to indicate that they're interested. Two of your pillars barely thought that they were going to come here because the Lions already knew. Sometimes they bring in people because they have so many question marks. I'm sure Jalen Carter spent seven hours going through his whole life history with the Lions. But I'll say this. Based on the tenor of what we're thinking, it's time to go get Will Anderson. Time to be bold. You can find a quarterback later on in the draft, and hopefully Teddy Bridgewater finds the love and appreciation for Detroit and comes in to be the best veteran backup in the entire National Football League. Because what are the odds? Lions move up and they handle business. Look, I don't see them trading uh, number 18 down to get more picks. I would see the potential of using 18, maybe even to move up to get a player, just like they did last year. Maybe they need the wide receiver, maybe for Quentin Johnston, maybe if they have another player in the first round that they just absolutely love. Um, Maybe it has to be for Kalija Kansi. I don't think that they would move down to get that many more picks, bro. They got 10 already. Yeah, I mean, it was it was just interesting, like the, the way it kind of came across. And again, <laughs> the 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 mock draft uh, program that I use, Chicago was the one that came to me. I didn't go to Chicago. Chicago was the one that came to me and nice. was like, "Hey, we'll give you all this." And I had to stop and think about it. And I was like, "Well, that's a lot of picks. You could <laughs> you could really add a lot of depth, and you could really transform a ton of stuff." I mean, it, at, at that point, you know what I'm saying? You would end up having what one, two, three, four. Five, six, six of the top sixty-four players. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, tough. Th- that's crazy. You'd basically have ten percent of of the first sixty-four players. You know what I'm saying? Drafted. It it's nuts, man. You would have you'd have ten percent of the top half of the draft. That's that's bonkers to me. So I, I just figured I'd throw it in there because it was one of those things where it was presented to me. I wrestled with it for a second, and then I accepted it, and then I seen what I could get on the back end, <laughs> and I was like, that's really interesting. That is really interesting. I don't know anybody who's going to basically give up that many draft picks, but I thought it was interesting to do. I am kind of in lockstep with you. I think the the the, the plan 1A is to take six and try to move up to three. You're going to want to pair that with, with, I mean, obviously you would try to give one of those second, fifth round picks, but I'm assuming it's probably going to take that first and probably an additional second for you to move up and get there. And then I think at 18, there's a lot of good players that should be available to you, whether it's uh, Bijan Robinson, uh, whether it's uh, Joey Porter Jr. could still be there, uh, whether it's uh, Kalijah uh, Clancy, who could still be there. Uh, Lucas Van Ness, he could still be there. There's a lot of good players at 18 that could really come in and make an immediate impact for your team. I don't necessarily know if you need to trade up with 18, but I think trading up with six, I think that is that is plan 1A. And I, I'm kind of in lockstep with you. I think Will Anderson on the, on the opposite side of Aiden Hutchinson, and then you rotate James Houston in, those are three gnarly sure. dudes who can just get at the quarterback and just make their life a living hell. And I, I think it would be fantastic. I think it will be awesome. And then if you take Elijah Cansey at 18, that's a guy who can play inside and outside. That's a that's a guy who has done stuff that we've really only seen a guy like Indomitian Sue do and a guy like Aaron Donald do. Uh, guys who are supposed to only play in the middle of the line but can line up outside – and have a rush where they can get to the quarterback, where they can sit there and drop back into coverage. Uh, A a guy who can basically play multiple positions along that defensive line. And I think that versatility, if you're a defensive coordinator, that makes you salivate. 
that gets you interested. That gets you geared up because now you've got to design special plays specifically for this player. How do we get him loose on an edge and how do we get him to just disrupt everything? How do we have him bull rush up the middle and just blow everything up? How do we get this guy free to cause as much havoc as possible? Or do we just have him drop back into coverage or do we just have him clog up the middle? Now, he's not necessarily a clog up the middle kind of guy. He's a little bit slight as far as his frame goes. But he's a guy who can do a ton of different stuff, and it can be incredibly impactful on the defensive line. Uh, again, this goes back to the job that Brad Holmes did in, in free agency. You can basically roll these Detroit Lions out on the field right now, and they could win you a football game. They, are, they have depth at just about every position. They are a team that is ready to go right now, day one. You're basically going out and you're looking to add more talent to a, a roster that is pretty much solidified. And then you are looking to add, possibly with your later draft picks, some depth positions who will end up rotating in and then taking over positions uh, either later in the year or the following year. So, look, I love the job that Brad Holmes has done. And I think it's it's fantastic the position that the Detroit Lions are in. Because, again, you can do anything you want with both of these picks, you know, and and back to the original question, I'm kind of in lockstep with you, right? Like, I think you should trade up for Will Anderson. Uh, if the price isn't, isn't too much, I think that's what you do. I think at 18, you could probably stay. You don't necessarily need to, 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 to trade that up to go grab another guy because I think there's going to be a ton of talent there. This is one of those drafts too, where it is incredibly deep, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball. There are a ton of good players you know, mock drafts are fun, and, and we enjoy doing them, and you enjoy posting them on, on all lines. <laughs> mock drafts are, are a ton of fun. There was a, a mock draft, I think it was done by The Athletic, where uh, Noah Sewell, who was a guy who was projected to go late first round, somewhere in the second round, fell to a fifth round pick. Like, if you can get Noah Sewell yeah. in the fifth round, like... Hello. That's crazy. That's like yep. absolutely crazy. Like that that that, that dude should should be a, a starting linebacker for somebody, and you're going to get value in the fifth round. That's how deep this draft is this year, where you've got guys who were were initially projected to go somewhere in the first or second round are now being mocked out to the fifth, and you're getting crazy value. So I think Brad Holmes is is going to have another killer draft, and I think he's going to slay this one, and he's got a ton of draft capital. Yeah, it's it's definitely a time to be encouraged. But, you know, are there any scenarios that you see that would be terrible for the Detroit Lions? I mean, I know a lot of people don't think there's going to be a run of quarterbacks, one, two, three, four, because that would be best case scenario, because then you're for certain going to get Jalen Carter or Will Anderson. I, I don't see a terrible scenario because the Lions have options to do whatever they want. They can sit back and let the board play out. If they're in love with Will Anderson, they're going to call the Cardinals. They're just because, you know, or they they might have to, because here's the thing, and I know, and it's real fascinating the chess moves that teams have to make. But you look at it and you say, would the Texans pass on a quarterback to take Will Anderson? You know, I don't think so. I think you can gamble that the Texans and the you believe that the first two picks are going to be potentially quarterbacks. Now, they could take them, and they could maybe get that information and figure it out, but I think that every scenario that could potentially play out, if you want to trade with Houston, if you want to trade with the Cardinals, I think you recognize that there's an opportunity to at least have conversations. And now, you know, in a few minutes, we're going to have another conversation about Jared Goff because there's a name out there that now for the seventh cycle – We'll talk about it again, but in a different flavor. But I don't think there's a scenario in which there's it's doomsday for the Lions. They can stay at six and get a player that they absolutely love. They're going to get two players, I believe, in the first round that they believe will fit the culture and do what they need to do. Whether it fits the needed offensive line, interior of the defensive line, wide receiver, quarterback, every option, even running back. You guys sit back, relax, grab a bourbon, and enjoy what Brad Holmes does. He's going to cook, and he's going to do great scenarios. He's going to do great things. I don't see a scenario in which it's doomsday in my mind. See, I I disagree with you a little bit. I think if you see a guy like Jalen Carter go, Tyree Wilson go, and and Will Anderson go, 
I think now you're in a bit of a funky spot because at that point, the next best player, uh, at least what's projected is, is a cornerback. And again, I told you, I don't necessarily like investing a sixth overall pick in a cornerback. I, I think that the Detroit Lions will get a player that they love. Yes, I do believe that. But is the value necessarily there? I think there's more value on a guy like Will Anderson, a guy like Jalen Carter, a guy like Tyree Wilson. I think there's more value in those guys. Or there's more value in grabbing uh, one of those first two quarterbacks. I don't think there's as much value in grabbing a corner. I don't think there's as much value as grabbing an offensive lineman at six. I just don't think the value is necessarily there. Now, I think if you end up in this situation where basically the three the three top uh, defensive players are gone and essentially one or two quarterbacks have gone and now you're staring down the barrel of a gun, I think it's best at that point to try to move back because yeah, I think you get yeah. more value and you can maximize the value of sure, that pick sure. to grab one of those cornerbacks a little bit later or possibly grab uh, a, a different defensive line player uh, a little bit later on. So I do think there's a bit of a doomsday scenario because it, it really feels like there are players that are going to go in the top five and then there's kind of everybody else in the first round. And then you're going to have some some residual leftover in the second round from guys that could have went in the first round. And then you're going to kind of start to really see the draft kind of spread out and, and start to kind of pick up. Now, there's like I said, there's a ton of talent here. But it really does feel like at the very, very top, it's five positions. It's five players deep. And then after that, it kind of becomes guys, like good guys, but they're, they're guys. They're not these guys who have this elite marker on them that these other top five guys have. So it, it, to me, yes, a bit of a doomsday scenario there okay. if you don't end up having that third quarterback go. Okay. It's going to be interesting to see, guys. One week away, we'll fine-tune it on next week's podcast as we kind of get more information as the rumors come out and more information does start to reveal itself. Uh, as you guys download this, the general manager, Brad Holmes, will speak on Thursday morning at 10. So stay tuned for that. You'll get a lot of coverage at All Lions about what he says. I mean, he's not going to give away the details, but he'll speak and he'll give uh, he'll, he'll give generalities. You know, the Lions are open for business to trade up or trade down. <laughs> They're interested in a quarterback and cornerback and defensive line. So you get a lot of that kind of stuff, but it, it'll be interesting to see how he maneuvers around some direct questions that will be asked by the media. So, cuz, it's very interesting in that Jared Goff said that the Lions have not talked to him really about an extension, nor should they. He's under contract for two more years. He's locked in. He's happy. He's making well over $25 million. He's fine. He's gotten lump sums. He's gotten millions. He's fine. Now, the blessing is, is that he knows if I play well, should be strong motivation, I potentially could get Jalen Hurts money. Jalen Hurts money will come to Jared Goff, not with one playoff win. I think NFC title or better, and Jared Goff could command north of $40 million, could get 225 with 160 guaranteed. No doubt about it. So he's taking a gamble, and so are the Lions. Many people would say, well, yeah, lock him up now because you can lower the cap and stuff like that, and you can uh, maybe get him for cheap. But I think the gamble it, it should be worth it for Jared to say, you know what? This football team is going to be good unless something crazy happens. I'm set. I'm doing pretty well. I should be okay, and if I do, you know, ride the wave of positivity, I could command 40, 45 million plus. I don't see now. It makes sense where people debate Jalen Hurts' contract and ask, "Is Jared Goff worth that?" No, Jalen Hurts. It has all the tools. Is mobile, can make good reads, had his team in the Super Bowl, and has the has the youth on his side where he can project to be a very productive quarterback for the next five seasons. But Jared Goff is a $200 million quarterback, no doubt about it. I think that as a smart, reliable passer in a system built for you, you can say he deserves a Daniel Jones contract at minimum. And that's four years, 160, a chunk guaranteed. I could live with that. Now the Lions have to take the gamble because if he gets to the NFC title game, his agent's going to be like, okay, more guaranteed, and we're going to hit north of 40, north of 45. So it's all good for Jared Goff, and I think that everything that's happened over the last 12 months in the quarterback market has made it so that Jared Goff is going to be rich beyond his wildest dreams, whether it's in Detroit or I heard something earlier today that was very smart and very wise from one of the local media members. 
Should Ben Johnson leave, Jared Goff can sit on Easy Street and make a phone call and say, Ben, hey, I want to go with you. And he'll have another team that potentially would pay him $40 million. So Jared Goff is, is, is fine. He's happy. He's got a great life. And he's got a team that loves him, a GM that was part of drafting him, a team that's been built around him. Maybe they'll give him a running back that he can hand the ball off to that reminds him of Todd Gurley. So Jared Goff has hit the life jackpot, and 2023 is when he cashes in. One playoff win is going to be equating to at least four years, $160 million. And it's great. It's great for Jared Goff right now. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think Jared Goff is a guy who sits in prime position to be able to cash in huge, huge. All he's got to do is go out and have a really good season, similar to what he did last year. One for it all. Go go get this team, win the NFC North, and and, and get this team into the playoffs and win a playoff game. And you will go down in Lions lore. You will be the guy (laughs) in Lions history. That's how beat up this fan base is. Yeah. Uh, But, yeah, look – I think for Jared Goff, he sits in a really good spot because, like you said, ball's kind of in his court, right? I mean, if he goes out and he performs like he performed last year, and look, this team is giving him weapons. They are going out and they are getting him guys. They are getting him players. He's got an offensive coordinator who understands what he does well and is putting him in positions to succeed. He goes out and he plays his ass off. When it comes time for for his contract to either be restructured or or to sign a new contract, ball's in his court. He can pretty much demand whatever it is that he wants, and if he's with the Lions, he'll probably get it. Or if, like you said, Ben Johnson leaves, that's a guy who he obviously has a connection with. That's a guy that he absolutely trusts. That's a guy in Ben Johnson who listens to what Jared Goff says every single week when they're installing the game plan for whoever they're playing that week. So Jared Goff can just as easily say, hey, Ben, where are you going? All right, cool. I want to come with you. And I'm just assuming that if there's a, a, a team out there that's going to be hiring Ben Johnson as a head coach, they probably don't have a quarterback, and they're probably not very good. Yes. So Jared Goff could totally go there, be their starting quarterback. You've got a, a new offensive-minded head coach, and you just kind of go from there. Sign your new massive deal, and let's roll. So, look, I think Jared Goff sits in a, a really, really good spot he does. right now. He does. If you're the Detroit Lions, would you would you enter into conversations before this season no. even starts and talk about nope. extending him? Nope, not at all. You got him locked in for two years. You have to do nothing else. He, his number's locked in. You know what you got. You got to make him prove it. You can't reward him for something he hasn't done yet. And the reward is the playoffs. Daniel Jones won a playoff game. So let's at least start and dangle that carrot that it's got to be a playoff win, not just getting to the postseason. It has to be winning in the postseason, being a factor in the postseason, not turning the ball over, playing well at Ford Field, hopefully in front of the home crowd when you win the division. You have to meet some goals, and I think he knows that. And I think he's up for the challenge. This team is no, it cannot be better prepared. Two more first-round picks, a stud wide receiver that has the blazing speed, that superstar potential, the hard worker in Amon Ross St. Brown, the the guts on both sides of the ball with Sewell and Hutchinson. I mean, th- there's nothing else that the Lions can really do other than go out now and take it, and it's about to happen. It has to happen. The talent level's there. The coaching staff's in place. The motivation's there. They know what's coming. It's coming. Ford Field is going to be the loudest place in Detroit for eight Sundays in the fall, and it's coming. But I do, you know, I mean, obviously you hope, you know, injuries don't derail everything, and you hope the mix because there's, there are a couple of new coaches, but because everything's there. You have the line, you have the defensive line, you have studs at defensive back, you have uh, safeties that are emerging. So there's a, there's a good chance this is going to be a 10-win team and 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 beyond. So I, I'm excited for what's going to come up next. But there is a glaring hole, and the biggest glaring hole is the backup spot. And now for the seventh time, we're not going to belabor it because we've talked about it here and at All Lions, but this is the seventh cycle because it was reported on Wednesday afternoon that teams, smart teams, were calling the 49ers about Trey Lance because everyone saw that Brock Purdy got the love of the, the players and the, the front office. 
So teams are calling. And I'm I'm for sure the, the Lions did their due diligence and lobbed a phone call. In my mind, yeah, you could take a stab at Trey Lance, but he's raw too. So in my mind, I I would do it for a fifth, nothing more, but it's a risk because you throw him in there in a playoff situation where he hasn't played all that much. He's coming off of a severe injury. I just say go draft a developmental guy. Find the guy that you love. Or you just pray and say, look, okay, Teddy, you got us over a barrel. Give us a number. Okay, we'll up our number a little bit. We'll figure it out. We'll make here's one more Here's $12 come. million. Dollars. Yeah, here's $10 million. Come on, Cuz. We're not spending no $12 million $12 on a backup. Mil. $10 million. So, <laughs> Teddy, figure it out. You know, come here to Detroit and make it happen. So, I'm basically non-committal on Trey Lance, but I mean, we've belabored the point. We've debated it seven times. It's intriguing, but I just, his inexperience makes it a no for me. Yeah. And look, unless you have a a high grade on him, right? Unless you're uh, a Ben Johnson, you're like, look, this guy could be, could be the future of this organization. I don't necessarily know why you're going to go after Trey Lance. Like Trey Lance hasn't done anything. He's been in the league two years and, and legit, he hasn't done anything. He's like a rookie. Like last he, year he got hurt, but he, like. He could be a cheap rookie that has mobility, but the problem is he's super raw and yeah, he, he'd be great to develop. No doubt about it. So but, I mean, this, this kind of goes back to the conversation with Hendon Hooker, right? So like, why not just go draft Hendon Hooker then? Because he's, it, old, it, he's, it, he's older it, and, and his, and I get it. And I know that the Lions love themselves, guys that are injured, but I just look at it like <laughs> in the draft, you could also, you know, hope to stash somebody away for three, four years and maybe just let them sit and learn and develop in a, in a good system. You know, Trey Lance is, is, is fine, but I don't know. I'm not seeing the, the trust level where if you got a guy that's already been drafted that high and coming off of that injury, and now you throw him in. I'd rather have a, a quarterback that's just been drafted, and the pressure's not as there. It, it, you know what I mean? It feels like Trey Lance would be set up to fail if he got thrown in because of his expectation. He's been drafted that high. He's got this modicum of an expectation of what he can deliver. I just would say that uh, I just basically would wish I wish there was more tape on him of him actually playing to make this kind of a move. I don't know. I don't know if Trey Lance is the developmental quarterback that's better than Anthony Richardson or better than Aiden O'Connell or somebody else that maybe potentially could come in here. So it's interesting. I do. I, I you have to believe the Lions made the call, but I just don't see it happening. The call, the name that you're hearing more that has a lot more smoke is the Vikings, and that makes a lot of sense. It makes it, a ton of sense. It makes a ton of sense, and I think that's where it's going to happen. I think that the Vikings want that next developmental situation, something a little different than Kirk Cousins brings to the table. And when you pair that with Justin Jefferson, I think they're more willing to take on the risk because they've paid Kirk Cousins a boatload of money. And I think if you're Trey Lance, you're loving it that you have potentially two NFC North teams that want you because uh, the opportunity is there to dominate and not have as much pressure as maybe the NFC East or the West or the South where it's a pressure cooker a lot of the times. But we'll see. Stay tuned. Trey Lance, a name, because it's really great, just a little behind the curtain. There are certain debates that now I've had multiple times that just keep having great returns. Top of the list is Jim Caldwell. Every time you write about Jim Caldwell, it brings up a debate about his history, his legacy, his two two watch wearing self is one. Trey Lance now is another one where we've had seven go-arounds about trading for Trey Lance. So I'm very happy that... Uh, the news about his future with the 49ers came out because in the, in the days before the draft after free agency, it can get repetitive with mock drafts. So uh, it's great. Trey Lance, thank you. The gift that keeps on giving. Cuz one last topic quickly, the other gift that keeps on giving the NBA draft. Hopefully the Pistons are able for once to get a top of the NBA lottery again to potentially get Victor Wembenyama. They won the lottery before, got Cade Cunningham, have used first-round picks on guys that haven't panned out, disastrous season resulting in Dwayne Casey getting a promotion. But now you got to ask, okay, could the Pistons, with the combination of Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, and Victor Wembenyama, could that mix get together and do some things? 
I think it could. I think the talent's there. Um, but my mind is similar in that, oh, yeah, when there's uh, Kate Cunningham, not a uh, superstar commodity, yeah, we'll give you the number one pick. Victor Wembenyama, worldwide superstar that could draw millions and millions and eyes and everything and, and world beater. I don't see the ping pong. I see the pi- the Pistons ping pong ball landing in some guy's hand, and he kind of just throws it aside and says, "Um, uh, do that again." Power went out. Uh, okay, maybe a different team. Okay, a little bit more marketable. Let's do that. So I'll, I, I first want to see where the Pistons end up drafting, but yeah, I could see Kate Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, and Victor Wembanyama getting together and doing some things. But with the caveat, you gotta get wings that can shoot. I feel like for five years. In the second wave of our podcast here, we haven't had consistent shooting in years in a league where everybody just isos and passes and shoots threes. Dwayne Casey never found consistent three-point shooters. And I'm like, my God, you got great slashers, you got great workers, you got bigs on the inside, and they kick it out to guys that brick it all the time. And I was like, my God, the three-point shooting, can it get to a level where it can be successful? So I think the Pistons can be dangerous. Their future is bright. I'm hoping, I think it's a pipe dream to get Udoka, but I think the next coach at least will have a track record of working with young talent and being able to develop them. So I think the, uh, the, the days of the Pistons being bottom feeders are hopefully over. Yeah, I think that trio could, could win you a couple NBA championships. Now, look, we've got to see some development from Cade, but I loved what I've seen from Jaden Ivey this year, and I've watched some video on Victor Wimbayama. He's unreal. Like, yes, yes. He's he's long. He's so very tall. Wingspan that stretches for days. And the guy can pretty much do it all. Like he can guard the rim. The guy can line up from beyond the arc and hit threes. He can carry the ball up. He can pass. He can play defense. And look, what what's the call? What's what is this team lacking? What is the calling card of, of, of Detroit? It's defense. They're lacking it. This is a guy who can do that. Now, look, yeah, obviously the, the ping pong balls have to fall for them. But I think this, I think that team, that, though, that, that is your big three. If you get a head coach in here who can develop this team and, and help mold Cade Cunningham and add a little bit more to Jaden Ivey and then bring Victor Wimbayama in and really put some utility tools around him. Yes. I, I think this team could do a lot of good and be very disruptive in the NBA. And I think they could win a couple of championships. I'm excited. The Pistons and Wings are now in that transitional phase where they went through phase one of their teardown. Now they're both entering into phase two where some winning is expected. And I think that the the Red Wings getting more points than they did last year, giving up less goals, taking the step forward. Now they just got to find replacements for the scoring that they gave up. The Pistons now moved on from the dead weight in their head coach. They can only go up from there because the defense cannot get any worse. And you're going to add a first round pick that is going to be very solid and contribute. And you got a young core. Jaden Ivey developed Jalen Duran. Don't sleep on him. Dude's a monster. So the Pistons are up and coming. And I think they're going to get into the 30s in the victory total, at least in the coming season. So stay tuned for the Pistons. Sleeping giant, but now finally turning the corner and will add the pieces necessary to handle business. Follow Adam on Twitter. Make sure you get his great takes and ask him any questions that you want. Hit him up on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the podcast network at Detroit podcast. Make sure if you've agreed or disagreed with anything that we said, feel free to hit us up. We enjoy the banter with this, the loyal followers of the Detroit sports podcast. Make sure anywhere that you listen to your favorite audio content, you type in Detroit sports podcast and our content will find you as we move forward through this new age of the rebuild city and a team now in the Detroit Lions that has expectations and are finally ready to live up to it. No better place to listen and follow along than the Detroit Sports Podcast Network.